all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone with VeteransRadio.net. We're recording today from the Legal Help for Veterans studio in Northville, Michigan. Legal Help for Veterans is a veterans disability law firm, and you can reach us at 800-693-4800. We're really happy today to have on Veterans Radio a quite distinguished guest who's going to help shed some light on uh, what is being called one of the hottest battles in Washington um, over VA's plan to ex- expand nurses' powers. We have with us Juan Quintana, who is the president of the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists. Uh, he is a, has, holds a doctorate degree from TCU and a master's degree from Texas Wesleyan. He is a veteran as well, so he certainly can relate to our listeners uh, and uh, family members of veterans here on Veterans Radio. Juan, uh, welcome to Veterans Radio. Hey, Jim. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation to join you. It is uh, certainly my pleasure to address veterans uh, across the country and, and to say thanks. Thanks for your service. Thanks for everything that you've given uh, to this great nation. Uh, we're proud to serve you. Well, uh, let's let's talk just briefly about uh, your nine or ten years that uh, you did in the United States Air Force Reserves. Tell us a little bit about what you did. Sure. Uh, you know, as uh, p- part of my being a, a reservist uh, in the 59th uh, Medical Wing at Lackland Air Force Base in Wilford Hall was to, in fact, provide anesthesia services while I was there. So we cared for veterans uh, there in the facility with all kinds of um, medical issues, primarily issues that related to surgery. We provided the anesthesia and, uh, as always, sought to do our very best for all of uh, the servicemen who were coming through and and needing uh, particular uh, fixes for different issues and their family members as well. Well, Juan, you completed your service um, as a captain in the uh, United States Air Force Reserves, went on to practice and continue to practice in the great state of Texas, and you're a certified registered nurse anesthetist, or CRNA. Can you explain to our listeners what that uh, designation means and what uh, the job role and responsibilities are? Sure. I think, you know, I'd like to back up just for your listeners just a little bit and talk about what APRNs are. Those are Advanced Practice Registered Nurses, and under that umbrella are Nurse Practitioners, Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetists, Midwives, and Clinical Nurse Specialists. All of us are considered Advanced Practice Registered Nurses. CRNA specifically uh, in this country are approximately 50,000 strong. We provide anesthesia services uh, to the tune of approximately 40 million surgical procedures per year. In those, we provide services all the way from patients who are infants to our geriatric population. We administer them in all kinds of locations, big hospitals, suburban hospitals, community hospitals, and down to the rural sector. And in fact, for our veterans, uh, CRNAs are located in just about all the facilities uh, that administer or have surgical services associated with them. In some, CRNAs are the only anesthesia provider. And in, for example, forward surgical teams, CRNAs provide those services to those servicemen who uh, find themselves in harm's way uh, out on the battlefront. So before we zero in uh, on CRNAs a little bit more, um, thanks for backing us up to advanced practice uh, RNs. Um, Do you have an idea of how many advanced practice nurses there are in the United States? Today, uh, Jim, there's approximately, I'm 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 getting closer because I don't have all the nurse practitioner numbers, but there are approximately 210,000 APRNs across the nation today. Uh, Again, they work in all settings, different environments, providing uh, all types of services, and uh, sometimes in association with physicians, sometimes separately. Uh, So the services are readily available and out there. Uh, 
um, with lots of data to show that uh, we're doing fantastic work out there. That's that's the trick, right? It absolutely is. We're talking to Dr. Quintana, who is the president of the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists. Um, Juan, in terms of uh, the training that one goes, I assume for each of those four specialty groups, the training to be a advanced practice nurse is a little bit different. But could you kind of tell our listeners the um, enhanced level of education and training that uh, advanced practice nurses have? Sure. All uh, advanced practice nurses move through a system whereby they obtain a registered nurse license in their state, and from there, either they'll have a bachelor's degree or uh, some kind of bachelor's degree that's attributed to that. From there, they move into master's, and now uh, primarily all advanced practice registered nurses are moving to doctorally prepared levels. In fact, in the near future, uh, anyone graduating from an APRN with an APRN degree uh, will it will have a doctorally prepared degree um, behind their name. That involves significant amount of hours with patients in in clinics, seeing different types of patients, different age groups depending on your specialty, and for example, in anesthesia, providing anesthesia services for all ages in all settings. So it's a a fairly intense system whereby we gain knowledge and experience very similar to our physician colleagues and uh, and thereby serve the community with uh, excellent outcomes, and all our studies show that. In, in this specific area for CRNAs, um, tell us a little bit more about how long it might take to become a CRNA, and are there special uh, educational schools for this sort of thing? How, how does one become a CRNA? Um, yes, you know, becoming a CRNA, and I'll let you in on something, is one of the toughest things I have ever done in my life. An intense form of education that uh, I really, I was surprised. I knew I was up for it, and it was a ton of work. But the time component to it, from the time you receive your bachelor's degree, after, in terms of anesthesia uh, education, we also require that you have at least, at minimum, one year of intensive care unit uh, training. And so that means being with patients at least eight hours, 12 hours a day, sometimes longer, while they're in critical uh, shape, you know, sometimes often after open-heart surgery, lung surgery, craniotomies, where they've had uh, some kind of uh, neurologic problem, uh, issues like that. So once you spend that year doing that, then at minimum, and what we find is on average, most CRNAs have approximately three years of intensive care unit training. And then you apply to the program and you spend what is currently an average of about 30 months to do it, but will soon be at minimum 36 months, so three more years on average right now. We could say that the CRNA is spending approximately nine years to achieve a CRNA designation. It's a kind of well, a long track. <laughs> yeah, these are highly specialized uh, nurses in these in this area of advanced practice. Um, any of those four, um, and is, is this you know for those of us who maybe aren't really all that familiar with it, is this a new thing? How long have there been? Uh, CRNAs or advanced practice uh, registered nurses? The, you know, the designation CRNA is something that uh, we started using, I guess, approximately in two, in the 1930s, something like that. But even prior to that, nurses administering anesthesia can be attributed all the way back to the Civil War, where nurses were administering anesthesia to uh, those servicemen. So it's been around for approximately 150 years, and we're not new to uh, to the uh, area of healthcare at all. Um, over the years, we've become more specialized, doing a lot more research, and uh, doing a lot more work. So that today, uh, you know, if you compared anesthesia perhaps from the 80s, we're about 30 times safer than we ever were then. Just gives you a sense of how progress, technology, all intertwined to achieve a super result 
combined with the outstanding education we have, and we have great results. Wow, that's uh, that's an incredible fact, and I can only imagine that as technology moves forward, as it has over the last decade or two, that's uh, made its way into your field um, and probably has helped on uh, generating those great outcomes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we have to think and uh, that, you know, in the past, I mean, if you went back, you know, just not, not too long ago, uh, it was only a physician could take your blood pressure. That was considered the physician's purview. Now today, you know, you and I know, you can go into Walmart and get your blood pressure taken. And so it's a bit different today. We've seen a lot of overlap, and we see that technology now is moving forward to help with that as well. We see that uh, more and more we can utilize the newer technologies to create a safer environment for patients, to teach us more about patients, and to deal with things that, in the past, perhaps we would not have been able to do. Uh, we're speaking to Dr. Quintana, who is the president of the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists and is a former captain of the United States Air Force Reserves. I want to back up to a comment that you made that uh, we maybe went a little too fast yeah. on. How are uh, CRNAs and advanced practice nurses being used by the Department of Defense? In, in the Department of Defense, at least in terms of, and I can't speak wholly to the nurse practitioner role, but I think it's pretty much like that. Uh, they are used to the full capabilities of their education. Why? Because it just makes sense. And so, for example, CRNAs are utilized, in, as I mentioned earlier, forward surgical teams in different uh, hospital settings, combined sometimes with anesthesiologists, at times without anesthesiologists, uh, but each of them working to their full capabilities. Uh, that just makes sense for the military. It's uh, a very reasonable approach. And as you can imagine, unless it was safe, it's uh, highly doubtful that they would adhere to it as much as they do. Well, that brings us on to VA's uh, proposal that has caused, as I mentioned at the outset, quite a stir. Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs Office of Nursing Services proposed a new policy document known as the VHA Nursing Handbook, and that uh, the principal purpose of that document is to expand the role of advanced practice registered nurses in VA healthcare facilities. And that's out as a new rule, I, I, as I understand it, and uh, as just reported in Stars and Stripes and the McClatchy Washington Bureau uh, news release, um, uh, in a, like a week, <laughs> 11,700 public comments were lodged regarding this uh, rulemaking, making it the hottest topic in uh, the federal regulatory world. Who would have thought that would be such a hot topic? But um, it, it seeks to have VA uh, create the opportunity to use advanced practice nurses and CRNAs as a subset there to the fullest extent possible. Um, is this something that... Uh, uh, the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists supports, uh, Dr. Quintana? Uh, absolutely, we support it. it. You know, we are all aware through media, through our own experiences, that sometimes the wait times at the VA service centers are and can be fairly terrible. We know uh, through information that we have received that sometimes veterans are waiting for their services to the detriment of potentially, in some cases, have lost their lives because of it. So what happened, uh, oh, what has happened over the last few years is that nursing, in cooperation with uh, the Institute of Medicine, have really determined that nurses could make a significant impact in alleviating these weights and, and, uh, and, and hopefully getting access to services to veterans who really need that care. So as part of it, we've evaluated ourselves and nursing has evaluated itself and said, hey, what's our quality? How good are we at doing what we do? And certainly when we've done that, study after study shows us that, gosh, we're pretty darn good at what we're doing, which is not a, in any way saying that our physician colleagues are, but there's just not enough of them. And so if we're both delivering outstanding services, then we need to get those services to the patients, to the vets who need that service. The American Association of Nurse Anesthetists of course, concurs with that 100%. Uh, 
There are approximately almost a 1,000 cRNAs in the BA system. And in some cases and in some hospitals, cRNAs have been the sole providers of anesthesia services for an extended period of time. We know that those outcomes from those individuals have been very good. And so while we see these delays, we as a nursing group, APRNs, came to the VA and said, hey, we can help with that. We can make it less of a problem. We can get those services to those veterans and alleviate some of these wait times. From our perspective, the veterans have earned it and they deserve that care. And it's our job to make sure that the veterans don't become the victims in this issue. So we so absolutely Dr. support it. Dr. Quintana, um, are the, uh, the outcomes you're talking about, have they been uh, studied and peer-reviewed by third-party uh, entities to, to confirm up that I'm going to get as, the treatment I'm going to get, the medical care I'm going to get uh, is going to be delivered as well if it's a uh, anesthesiologist or if it's a nurse anesthetist. Absolutely, and we've uh, done several studies. Most re- uh, we did them in 2009, where we evaluated it. We evaluated again in 2011, doing a little slightly different comparison. And then most recently, we actually evaluated, which was just published in uh, Medicare. Uh, I'm sorry, in uh, Medical Care which is a a manuscript that is published a journal, and it compared the scope of practice, that is, the practice of each CRNA in different locations and and basically different states. And what they did was they compared the really restrictive ones as compared to the extremely liberal in terms of permitting the CRNA to practice to the full, to the top of their educational level. In the comparisons, they found no difference in the care in one versus the other. That actually just affirms what we have always thought, that in fact, CRNAs and our anesthesiologist colleagues are administering excellent anesthesia today, 30 times better than it was in the 80s and safer today than it ever has been. And so what our position is, quite frankly, that we need to make sure that we're getting those services to the veterans. We continue to hear about issues like delays in cardiac surgery, GI scoping, endoscopic techniques. And we know that in the endoscopic world, getting an early resolution to problems that you might have in a colonoscopy or an endoscopy are vital to survival. And in cardiac cases, we know that, gosh, that's not something any of us want to put off. If we have an issue, we'd like to take care of it as soon as possible. Well, one of the things I should point out to our listeners is that 21 states already have this expanded uh, scope of practice for advanced uh, practice uh, registered nurses, empowering them to manage treatments and diagnose patients and more. So VA's proposal is not, uh, uh, you know, brand new cutting edge sort of stuff. It's following what 21 other states have done and, and really for the same purposes. The uh, VA Undersecretary of Health, uh, Dr. David Shulkin, has issued statements uh, indicating that he thinks that this would increase VA's capacity to provide timely, efficient, and effective primary care services. But there's a lot of criticism, uh, Dr. Quintana. Um, The uh, number of the uh, American Medical Associations, the Association of uh, Anesthesiologists, American Society of Anesthesiologists, all are kind of crit- critical of uh, this move forward by VA. Uh, how do you look at that uh, criticism? You, you know, I, I appreciate you uh, bringing that up because I think it's important to recognize concerns that people have. And being able to discuss those openly and debate those as professionals is the way to get that move forward. From our side of the equation, that is from the advanced practice nurse and more specifically the certified registered nurse, our job is to provide an excellent service to veterans, to their families, their children, and to achieve that, we evaluate ourselves and make a determination whether or not we are up to par. All our studies, all our information says absolutely. And while we understand that sometimes it's hard for physicians, as I mentioned earlier, for a while, it was only a physician that could take your blood pressure. Today, Walmart can do it. So 
while I understand their concerns, and sometimes it's a little battle of like, are you overlapping into my workplace? Am I overlapping into your workplace? That the overarching message here is servicemen, veterans need our care. And that really, it's a good time to put down those turf wars and start looking at how we can better achieve access to services for those veterans so they are not the victims in this situation. From our perspective, we recognize their concerns. We have data to show that their concerns are essentially unfounded. And they're not really providing any data to show anything otherwise. So we're going to have to a little bit stick to our guns because we feel like at the end our mission is just what we want to achieve is access to services for veterans. Let, let me take it from the broad category down to the individual, because we've we've all seen, uh, uh, you know, we can talk about doctors doing good work, but there's, you know, we can get down to, a, hey, this is a bad doctor. Um, how does it work with uh, advanced practice uh, nurses and CRNAs if if somebody's not up to snuff or they're, you know, things in their life have interfered with them delivering services. What what are the licensure, discipline, what, what are the steps? Is there a protection there for the patient? Absolutely. Uh, you know, what you should know is that in the hospital setting, in an ambulatory surgery setting, whenever you are providing a service there, if you are having any kinds of problems or you're not providing a service that is up to par, it's internally first handled by the facility. Facilities and peers will see that and they'll evaluate your service. And in that, they'll make recommendations, either uh, some kind of remediation, something to help you improve what you're doing and do better at it, and or they'll find that you are not capable of providing the service and they'll ask you to move on. In addition to that, if there's any issues Beyond that, it's actually very similar to the pattern the physicians follow, and in some cases, essentially the same. It's just that the State Board of Medicine would not be handling it. The State Board of Nursing would typically be handling the issue, and they handle and address those issues on a regular basis. So the veterans can feel comfortable that while there are, let, let's say, the majority, 99% of all of us out there functioning in healthcare world today in this evolution that is occurring provide an outstanding service. Some folks have, for whatever reason, not been able to keep up or are not doing a good job, and we're readily addressing those issues and making sure that those folks don't stay in healthcare if they're unable to improve. We're talking to Dr. Juan Quintana, who is the president of the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists, and we're talking about a proposal that VA has out to... Um, broaden and ensure that uh, advanced practice registered nurses have a full uh, authority to practice to the full extent, like they do in 21 states. Um, Juan, a lot of things that come out of Washington are ultimately decided by politics, maybe not, uh, maybe not reason or common sense. Um, <laughs> how, do you see the, how do you see the politics moving forward on this? Well, I think, uh, Jim, that, it, that, you know, at this time, the driving force has to be the need that veterans have with regard to their health care services. And in that sense, I encourage all the veterans to, uh, you can certainly join our website at www.veteransaccesstocare.com and fill out letters and say that you support this issue so that you can get access to services. And many of you, when you're servicemen, were in fact treated by nurse practitioners or CRNAs. And so I think that, and I'm certainly hoping that, will be the driving force here, that while we listen to and uh, openly discuss the concerns of individuals, especially our physician colleagues, that at the end of the day we recognize the value of nursing today is much broader than it was in the past and that we can achieve excellent, excellent care for our veterans today so that they can uh, avoid those waits and those times when, uh, you know, my biggest concern would be that something uh, tragic would happen in that interim. Well, as we wrap up, uh, Juan, why don't you give that uh, website again where folks can go if they'd like to uh, do more on this issue? Absolutely. That website, again, is www.veteransaccesstocare.com. 
all lowercase. And when you go there, it'll ask you to take action, and you click on that button, and after that, you have several choices from which you can uh, file out uh, letters so that your message gets across to the individuals uh, to whom it makes a difference. And it makes a difference to all of us, but we have to get that voice, that power behind it, and make it loud and clear for all those folks in Washington and at the VA that we want change and that APRNs can help us get care, and we want that care. Well, I want to thank Dr. Juan Quintana, President of the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists, for enlightening us today about uh, advanced practice nurses and, in particular, about uh, CRNAs, the group that he leads. I want to thank all of you for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fossone. It's been a pleasure to be your host and bring you this uh, unique interview. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans, and you can reach us at 800-693-4800 or LegalHelpForVeterans.com. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to our podcasts and Internet radio shows by going to www.VeteransRadio.net. And until next time, you are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800.